very commonplace. So I'm here at the Coy Center, a uh, uh, world-renowned uh, dental continuing education center run by a um, respected dentist, Dr. John Coy's. We're here for a oral systemic meeting. A lot of dentists are here learning about the connections between oral health and uh, cardiovascular disease, dementia, strokes. Um, <clears throat> I uh, met a new friend here, Dr. Roger L. Price, who's been in the area of breathing, uh, some sleep breathing, some other types of breathing, um, <clears throat> and in fact would say it's not uh, sleep apnea usually, it's not sleep disordered breathing, it's uh, breathing that would be a problem both in the daytime and at night. So again, very, very different perspectives. Also, I think would focus on making sure that people have been trained to breathe before you start a lot of instrumentation and, and surgery and things like that. Uh, <clears throat> we were having dinner the other night and uh, Roger, you mentioned to me, Ford, yeah, I can tell you had some problems probably with some mouth breathing when you were a kid. You got this mm. maybe long face and I said, no, I never had problems with mouth breathing. Um, <clears throat> we talked a little bit about um, tonsillitis and, and tonsil problems and it occurred to me after I went back to my room Yes, I had my tonsils removed when I was seven years old. And so I had a lot of issues in terms of um, airway infections. So <clears throat> maybe you were right after all. Why don't you <laughs> tell us a little bit about kids and uh, tonsillitis? All right. Tonsils. Well, the planet has 5,432 different types of mammals, different species of mammals. And man is the only mammal that will sleep with its mouth open. If you have dogs and cats, if you have hamsters, if you have all kinds of things, watch them when they sleep, their mouths are closed. The second thing to remember is that we have a lymphatic system. And the lymph nodes are basically trash cans. And they're there to trap the unfriendly stuff that enters the body. And they need to be flushed. Those trash cans need to be emptied. And look where you have lymph nodes. You have them in your neck, you have them in your groin, you have them in your armpits. You have them all over the place. And the lymphatic system does not have a pump like the circulatory system. Lymph is driven by muscle movement. So as the muscle planes and muscle plates move, so the lymph is squeezed through the body, goes through the lymph nodes, flushes them, and that is how we keep the system running. So your major lymphatic organs in the neck are your tonsils and your adenoids. These are the, the back of the nasopharynx, the back of the oropharynx, and their job is to act as microfilters. So if you breathe the way the mammals are designed to breathe, through the nose, allowing the hairs to trap the floating stuff, allowing the enzyme in the mucus to kill the viruses and the bacteria, to allow the turbinates to bring the air to body temperature, to allow a gentle flow of air to go across the paranasal sinuses to stimulate the release of nitric oxide, which is a potent antimicrobial and also a very potent vasodilator. The sinuses then produce two liters of water a day, and the air going through that moist area then becomes humidified correctly and nicely washed and cleaned. And finally, in case any little micro nano things happen to have escaped that, the adenoids and the tonsils act as the finer filters. So basically what I'm hearing is that the, these are the filters. So if you're breathing through your mouth, you're overusing these filters, the tonsils and adenoids, and underusing filters in your nose? Is that what you're well, saying? Well, you're bypassing the first four stages of filtration, okay. and you're expecting those microfilters to do a macrofiltration job, which is uh, why they okay. become engorged and inflamed and overloaded. But this is the kicker, this one. When you breathe through your mouth, the tendency is to use your upper chest. And the breathing is short and shallow and in and out through the mouth and the upper chest. If you do that, you're not using your diaphragm. And the diaphragm is the prime pump for lymph. So not only are you overloading the trash cans, but the flush trucks are on strike. Mm. 
So this is the double whammy where those lymph nodes are not being cleared, therefore they become inflamed, they become congested, they become infected, and the vast um, percentage of obstructive sleep disorders in children are engorged tonsils and adenoids. So what I'm hearing again is maybe another plea to stop and look at some maybe breathing training related issues before you start thinking about surgery. Absolutely. The only rider to that is that if there have been that many infections over a period of time that there's a fair amount of scar tissue, the scar tissue will not be reabsorbed. Yeah. But in many cases, three to four weeks of changing the breathing routine from mouth and chest to nose and diaphragm is enough to get the lymph to start to empty those engorged trash cans and the tonsils and adenoids uh, return to a functional size. Say that again. I mean, not the whole thing, but let me just tell me whether I'm right or wrong. Three or four weeks of proper breathing training, and you think you can get most kids to a place where they don't need surgery? Yes. Very interesting. Any other comments before we sign off? Basically, that's it. I'm in favor of removing tonsils and adenoids if they are so big and so damaged that there is no way you can return them to normal. I but get it, that. Yeah. I, I get that you're not saying don't ever do surgery. I think what you're saying is, look, surgery is a serious thing, and just make sure that we've done this trial of uh, breathing training before you go there. Or find right? out why have they become congested and inflamed in the first case and then eliminate the problem, then the solution, nature takes over by itself. Very good. That's very helpful, Roger. Thank you again, and thank, thank you for your interest. Again, my pleasure, Ford.